what is the eventual promise of fuel cell technology? You know, where, where would you like it to go in five years or 10 years? So the thing about fuel cells is it's, the, it's essentially like a solid state technology. It's the cross between the best of both worlds of batteries and, uh, and engines, with the exception that it produces no pollution at all. So if you think about a fuel cell, it's a battery that runs on fuel. So as long as you have fuel, you always have power. And of course, that power is completely clean. The only thing that comes out of our exhaust pipe is water vapor. Hmm. So the promise long term for fuel cells is really the promise for all distributed generation. If you think about um, the future of energy, uh, no one type of, uh, of, of energy is going to solve the problem. As we move away from fossil fuels, there'll be a constellation of different types of technology that solve different types of energy problems. So fuel cells, as you, as you remember, uh, 10, 15 years ago, was believed to be the, uh, the wonder technology. Um, we were going to have a fuel cell car in every driveway. It was going to power the world. And I think the industry, both investors and, 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 uh, and uh, consumers alike, uh, looked at fuel cells and, and, and uh, believed what they were hearing about, it, uh, about its future. And then reality kicked in at some the point? The reality is that like many uh, sophisticated new technologies, it takes many years to get it into the market and to make, have the market grow. And fuel cells have never been off track, they're on track. The difference is the expectations of investors uh, back then was out of sync with what the industry could produce. And so something has changed. Um, today, it's quite a, it's a very different uh, model in fuel cells. The fuel cell industry has been able to deliver on its promises, has set realistic timelines, and companies like Ballard, we have focused entirely on near-term markets, markets where we can get revenue this year, next year, high growth markets. I'm delighted that that Bloom is making progress and that they're a company that's on the move in this space. Uh, we really need the competition in the industry in order to create a healthy industry. But what we don't need is promises that can't be kept. And so Ballard has spent a tremendous amount of effort uh, going to a, a what's called a show don't tell philosophy where we, if we say we're going to do it, we deliver. From a cultural standpoint, why do you think so many sort of average folks have never heard of fuel cell technology before? If they have, it's a very sort of a limited understanding of what it's about, but they've heard of wind and solar and uh, even bio energy. I mean, why do you think fuel cell technology is sort of a bit behind in terms of a, an awareness within a greater population? Um, because it's, it hasn't touched them personally yet. You think about the things that you know about when a new iPod, iPad comes out, you know, we all know about it because it's, it's something we want to touch personally. Well, when the automotive fuel cell initiatives were much stronger 10 years ago, many people knew about fuel cells. It went quiet because many of the industries that the fuel cells went after were not consumer oriented. So it became a little less, uh, you know, less available. The difference with fuel cells are they produce energy anytime they're needed. So they're not, they don't have the same downside as other renewable or green technologies. So we think as you think about the future of energy, you're going to see this constellation of different types, wind and solar, biomass, but also fuel cells play a key role. And that is a very large market. So this is a slightly smaller version of the bus? Here. Right, so this is a, this is a, a, a mock-up of our fuel cell bus. It looks to a consumer just like every other bus, it just makes no noise and creates no pollution. So what's, so you, what's in here? So you come in with a system like this. This is a telecommunication system produced by our partner, Dantherm. And in here uh, are uh, everything needed to run their, their, their mobile phone network. So what you've got here is a fuel cell. This provides all the power for this system. So this system is not connected to any power source at all. The energy comes out of here and it runs their telecommunication equipment, which is in, in here. It's their radios. Right, so the wireless is, signal can be sent out. Which is connected then to the wireless tower. And this runs their whole their whole uh, uh, wireless network. So what you can do is you can install one of these anywhere that power is needed. Here in Canada, there's a new uh, a new carrier called Wind Mobile, relatively new startup company, and they're competing for the for the for the uh, wireless business here. Well, 
they've growing so fast that they have not been able to get um, uh, wireline connection for power in some of the regions. So instead of waiting, they just put one of these fuel cell power systems in and overnight they're up and running. So it's, it's revolutionized the way telecom carriers can get energy and also in a clean, environmentally you know, uh, 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 responsible way. So I'm imagining an installation like this out in the middle of nowhere, That's right. essentially, yeah. and uh, every so often a guy shows up with another hydrogen tank. That's right, well, hydrogen or natural gas. Or natural gas. Um, okay. well, and one of our partners uh, that, uses, that uses Ballard fuel cells has made a system that runs on methanol. So methanol is a liquid, easily transportable, and can be put in you know, five gallon jugs and walked around the central, the central desert of, of Africa uh, to fill up a system. So um, as, as I said before, you know, we're in a, a new world where energy has got to be provided in many different ways. And fuel cells play a key role in the growth of the energy uh, distribution around the world. This is an example of how it's done. Multiple fuels, multiple regions, um, all specific to what the needs of that particular area are. And how does this compare cost-wise so, to its alternative? So uh, in, uh, you just pick on a place like uh, India, it will cost less to operate this in India than they use today. So this is a cost savings for them. More importantly, it's more reliable. It takes less maintenance. You don't need the, it, you know, it's not a, 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 an engine that has a thousand parts that has to be rebuilt twice a year. Uh, it doesn't have batteries that wear out. So the maintenance on it's much simpler and a better fit for developing regions. So why aren't these everywhere? Well, it's a new, it's, we're just at the beginning of the, of the growth cycle in this particular segment. And remember, the telecom operators, um, these are large companies that take sometimes years to qualify new, new approaches. So um, almost every large telecom operator in the world either has a fuel cell system today or is looking at testing one. So we're already at that point. I would expect as years go on, we're going to see a continued growth in that. Uh, 10 years ago, uh, most consumers didn't know about fuel cells. Today, there's over 100 megawatts of fuel cells going into production, into, into, into operation around the world apartment buildings in Korea, uh, grocery stores in the U.S., um, chemical plants um, around the world. So there are, you know, fuel cells are, are now becoming, um, getting just into what I would call the early adoption cycle for large-scale distributed power. And, and I think there'll be a, a point where it'll be a mainstream solution, just like wind and solar. The policy, government support, utilities playing a role in making sure that that, uh, that the right um, feed-in tariffs are available is all key to bringing a greener, cleaner energy constellation to, to our world.